what challenges are we trying to solve? So if you look at the higher education landscape, it's going through a, a radical change. I believe it is. You're seeing 100 million new students coming into the education system in the next 12 to 13 years uh, by some statistics that you know, we've looked at from the OECD and, and from UNESCO and others. You're seeing uh, interesting you know, goals being set. So the US Department of Education has said, within the next five years, we want all content for K-12 to be digital. Just think about how, how much of a change that's going to mean. Uh, you, you know, if you look at the workplace learning experience, how many tr career transitions people go through and, and the retraining and, and the re-education that's needed. I think it's also one of the key reasons why you're seeing MOOCs and open content and open courses really take off is because workplace learning is largely a, a problem that still hasn't been solved very well. Uh, if you look at you know, the students that you're educating today, you know, a lot of you have laptops in the room. I noticed there's a few iPads. Um, the primary use of this technology is very quickly becoming mobile. So if you look at teaching and learning environments, uh, you're not going to be accessing it with a desktop or, or a laptop in the future. It's going to be smartphones, it's going to be iPads, it's going to be other types of tablet devices. And we're seeing that tsunami coming very, very fast, and I don't think the institutions are quite ready for it yet. And then if you look at where we work in the traditional teaching and learning space, uh, we're seeing the growth of online, fully online programs just taking off. Uh, some of our clients, 40% year-over-year growth for the last 10 plus years. Just incredible pace compared to their 3% you know, regular enrollment growth. Uh, and then we're seeing blended learning and hybrid learning uh, really exploding within both K-12, higher education, and now into the, into the workforce area. Um, but the one thing that strikes me is if you look at 100 million new students coming into higher education and further education, which is where most of you work, you know, how is that going to happen? Are you going to build new buildings? to accommodate that, that demand, because there's never been more demand for higher education. Uh, and I, don't, I think you will. I think there will be a lot of buildings built. But I think just like in Africa, when they were putting in the phone system and telecommunications, it went to wireless. It went to the next generation. And I think you're going to see this happen with, with higher education as well. You're going to see that growth accommodated through online learning and through, through those types of experiences. Um, I think there's four really big trends. There's, you, could, you could probably layer a few more, like mobile and, and a number of others, but uh, you're seeing a, a huge transition from like traditional do-it-yourself implementations to more of a cloud, SaaS-based model. You're seeing traditional brick-and-mortar schools moving to online and blended, blended complementing what happens in the classroom, obviously. Uh, you're seeing textbook publishers move to, to digital content, and obviously the universities and, and colleges are following suit. And you're seeing a one-size-fits-all model uh, you know, tr traditional lectures, other types of approaches, shifting towards a much more personalized experience, layering analytics, layering data to really d develop individualized learning plans and differentiation uh, and personalization of the learning experience. So I think you can accommodate that growth and you can still make it a much more personal experience. You know, I took this picture, one of our clients is Oxford University Press, I took a picture of the old press as I walked into their building. You know, they're doing a small pilot of three and a half million users, which is not a, you know, it seems like a big pilot, but small for them. Uh, the publishers are starting to figure out how to, how to make this transition, how to make this leap. And it's exciting to see what can be possible now that content goes digital in terms of an understanding of how students are using it, what's being understood, what's not being understood, and getting that feedback loop being closed with the instructor. Blended learning we see uh, growing very quickly. It's an interesting uh, stat at the University of Guelph, which is one of our first clients. Uh, they launched this open online program, and they've got now over 50,000 enrollments, up from 1,000 when we first started working with them. Uh, but interestingly, 80% of those enrollments are from on-campus students. So students that choose to pay extra to do it online uh, compared to what they would do in the normal classroom experience. And it's students choosing uh, the model of online or blended experience uh, that's driving uh, that adoption. You know, you probably hear a lot about flip the classroom and webcasting. Uh, I think this technology is really going to have a big impact on, on institutions around the world. But I think it's, it lends itself to an, an, another opportunity and another big you know, driver for that change. And that's the shift from uh, students being consumers of learning experiences to students becoming producers of learning experiences. So if we can build the technology and these platforms to sort of shift the dynamic uh, so that students that want to contribute, that want to to share their experiences, make it a much more engaging experience. Uh, I think we're going to have a, a wonderful uh, teaching and learning experience for the future. 
And I'm going fast here. I hope, that, <laughs> I hope that's okay. Um, the, the other thing that you're going to see is as you push towards more and more enrollment, more and more growth, and yet you, a demand for more and more personalization, is the need to expose data, both to the instructors and professors, as well as to the students and other stakeholders that matter. Uh, so the ability for you to leverage analytics and predictive modeling uh, to really understand how students are doing and get them on the right path uh, is going to become a much more important initiative. You know, a, a good example of this would be uh, one of our clients, Harvard, ha has not a very big class size for their MBA program, but you come into it, you've got pre-assigned pre seating, they'll open up the seating chart, they'll see who's got the lowest scores, who haven't they called out to recently. They leverage this analytics and this understanding to really create a more dynamic teaching experience in that classroom, not just for the online students as well. Um, I'm also a huge believer in the shift towards really embracing the community within the, w where the universities and colleges are. Uh, I see this at, in my hometown where I'm on the board of a, a group called Communitech, which helps young entrepreneurs uh, start and grow companies. Uh, and we've partnered with like, the local universities and colleges to run educational programs, training, boot camps for entrepreneurs, uh, really embracing uh, the potential of the community and the institutions of higher education to really advance the, the experience for those entrepreneurs. And it's grown to the point today where in Waterloo, it's become one of the hottest technology you know, clusters in, in probably North America, uh, where there's now a startup being created pretty much every, every day or every other day. Uh, which is incredible considering it's a community of only 500,000 people. Uh, and if you take this to whoop, an, another extent, uh, I recently had the opportunity to visit Brazil, and one of the programs that uh, really you know, sparked uh, a, a great deal of interest with me was the, a program called the Thousand Women Program. Uh, and in this program, it was Canadian institutions working with Brazilian institutions to lift a thousand women out of poverty. So these were women that were probably young mothers uh, quite often that had maybe grade two, grade three, uh, you know, uh, educational experience. Uh, these institutions helped them get their elementary, their secondary education, get a college degree, uh, and now uh, getting them employment into the workforce. And to hear these women talk about how the educational experience that they received just transformed their entire lives uh, was, was overwhelmingly powerful. There wasn't a dry eye in the room, and the president, President Dilma, is now committed to seeing this grow to 100,000 women. Uh, but that's a nation where they see the potential of education in transforming lives and ensuring some of their core principles around social justice uh, and, and, and helping achieve their mission of, in the last two years, getting to 35 million people lifted out of poverty, uh, which is not a small, small undertaking. And, uh, and if you look at the tools that are being used by the educators in this case, prior learning assessment, these things have been around for a long time. Uh, the ability for them to leverage online and distance education, uh, and the ability to leverage not just the technology, but great experiences to, to, uh, to really build a program here that's, that's very, working very well. Uh, in northern Ontario, which is where, near where I'm from, uh, you know, parents uh, used to send their kids about 600 miles to the to the closest school to finish their education. So they might have primary education in their local town, but then when they get to high school or secondary, they would have to be shipped off to go to school. And so leveraging online learning was all of a sudden a, an ability for those kids to stay in that community, stay with their parents, and really have a transformational impact on their lives. And this is a story from 10 years ago, you know, where we get letters from parents just saying how much of an impact it has on them. Uh, and then, you know, if I go back to Brazil, I'm not sure if you can tell what that is in this, in this photo, but you know, one of the big things I'm a believer in is experiential learning. So I jumped in a boat and went down the Amazon. Uh, so you know, if you're in the Amazon, it's a, you know, it's a good experience. You got to see where the two rivers meet and the, how one side of the river is really hot and one side of the river is really cool. Um, and you could tell just you know, very quickly, it's, there's, a, there's a line in the river that you can actually see uh, very clearly. But we got passed by these things. And, they're, they're, and when I asked what they were, and you can tell if you can speak a little bit of Spanish or, or French maybe, they're school buses. And it, you know, I clued in, school buses, oh, that's right. I mean, how else would you get picked up as a student in the Amazon other than by boat? And you travel up and travel down. But just think about how geography has a big impact on people's lives. What does that mean? That means they start school late and they leave school early. Why? Because it's dangerous to be on the Amazon in the night. Uh, so geography, uh, 
has a big impact. Uh, the ability for us to leverage this technology to really break down a lot of barriers to accessing high quality educational experiences is something that we see as, a, as an incredible amount of potential. You know, making learning accessible to everybody is another th thing that's driving the adoption of these types of teaching and learning experiences. Uh, so, you know, working very hard with, you know, whether you've got learning disabilities or people that are blind, being able to level the playing field for them to be able to participate on an equal footing. In some cases, you know, if you're blind, leveraging our platform uh, and the ability for them, for them to participate just as well as, or even in some cases better, uh, than someone that's, uh, that doesn't have that disability. Um, I also think uh, a big part of future learning is experiential learning. So uh, one, one example of this is some of our staff had the opportunity to spend two weeks in Rome and uh, two weeks in China uh, on a, a school tour with students, uh, capturing you know, how do they use technology in this experiential learning world. I don't know how that was classified as work and how they got paid to do this, but uh, it was certainly something that uh, I would like to sign up for in the future. But what was fascinating was the ability for students to go around taking photos of all the different places they're going, uh, being able to link that back into uh, the, like the learning system so that they could say before they actually left, here's what I want to learn. They get there, they reflect on the, what they wanted to learn and what they actually did learn, uh, being able to tie it back into the curriculum. And so if you can start really thinking about how do we make the world our classroom versus just making um, all the learning experiences have to be captured in that, that class experience. I think it all of a sudden starts to open up, open up your mind to the potential of um, the, the power of breaking down a, a lot of different walls and a lot of different barriers and capturing those learning experiences in new ways. But then how do you recognize it? How do you give credit for it? And how do you, um, how do you bring, it, bring it back into the, to the institution? So things around making it easier for you to capture uh, the learning experiences that happen in a social environment or an environment outside of the traditional classroom experience and being able to recognize that in the educational journey is very important. Things like e-portfolios drive a lot of that as well. Uh, and then at, if, if, if you get an opportunity, I'm not sure if anyone here is from Australia, but I've gotten an opportunity to visit with uh, you know, people from Singapore, from Australia, from all over the world. And one of the things that I'm seeing as a trend, whether it's in the K-12 sector or higher education, is that there's a, a rethinking about what does it mean to provide uh, an educational experience. Uh, at Deakin, um, they, you know, they've just launched a new brand called Worldly, uh, really focusing in on what does it mean to be a Deakin student. So defining the attributes that they want to have in their student population beyond just the programs. It doesn't matter if you're in the medical school or in business or other areas. Here's the attributes that we want to develop within this in, with each student. Uh, and thinking about how that translates across different programs and how do you track that and how do you support it and how do you, how, how do you develop those, those attributes. Uh, in K-12 in, in Alberta, uh, what's interesting is they're also doing the same thing. So when they're graduating their high school students, they want to see them becoming entrepreneurial thinking. They want to have you know, the ability for them to, to develop beyond just the maths and the sciences and everything else. They want to be able to develop attributes that go beyond those, those course walls, if you will. Um, so there's, there's a lot of change happening in education. I think you guys are probably well attuned to that as much as I am. Um, and I think, you know, the really important part about uh, what we're trying to build is making sure that you're building on top of an extensible and, and open platform that enables you to pull in all of these experiences and be able to capture them uh, and be able to, uh, you know, if, if, you're, if you're designing a learning experience uh, strictly for the traditional classroom experience, you're not, you're, you're, you're not meeting the needs of a lot of the uh, students that we're seeing in the for the future. I think it's the ability for you to be able to go out and rethink about how do we want that experience to be. Uh, and, and I don't think there's ever been a time in, in history where people have been this willing to make changes uh, to that educational experience. You've got an opportunity here where there's a lot of change, there's a, a lot of pressure to look at different uh, avenues for how do I want to make uh, modifications to that experience. And I think it's a golden opportunity for institutions to, to really understand uh, how do I develop the best teaching and learning experience for my students and what defines me as an institution? Uh, otherwise, I think there's an opportunity to be, to be disrupted. I think uh, other institutions are, are seizing onto this as an opportunity for them to continue to grow and to reach new students and bring knowledge to the world. Uh, and I think that's all I had for time.